When you think of Pokemon Yellow, you think of Red and Blue, but Pikachu. Being the first third version of a Pokemon game, you basically play through the exact same story and events of the first game, but with Pikachu. Oh, and I guess all three stars too. Despite the other little extra bits it offered, there's really not much to talk about this game that you couldn't in the original ones. So what does this have to do with the video? Nothing. Because this is a sequel. A sequel to the events of the vastly different manga incarnation with a brand new protagonist and a very unique story to tell. On a level that's arguably much bigger than any incarnation of Pokemon, period. Before we jump into this though, this video will contain spoilers of the first arc, which I already made a video on, and I encourage you all to check out for the sake of context. With that said, my name is Deucey Gunner, please do subscribe because this is honestly really embarrassing, and this is my review of Pokemon Adventures Yellow. But first, here's a preview of what's to come. Who do you like best, Bruno? I say the sullen one. Look, the cheerful one's about to make his choice. <laughs> huh, they really demolished this place. So this is what the once mighty Sylph Company comes to. Like they say, the bigger they are, the bigger they fall. Well, I guess it always pays to check. The Yellow Arc consists of four volumes and takes place two years after the events of the Red, Green, and Blue Arc, centering around the manga's first ever original character, Yellow. Illustrated by the same artist who did the first arc, Mato, it captures the familiarity that readers have become accustomed to with this incarnation of the Kanto region and its cast. Now some may think this follows the same exact Pokemon story formula that we've witnessed throughout these 25 plus years, both in the games and the anime. With Yellow having the same goals to be the absolute best, right? OBJECTION! That's right folks, quite literally from the second arc of the 25 plus year series, the formula is completely dispatched, opening infinite more possibilities for how it may all play out. And as for the story? Well, you're about to find out now. The story immediately pulls no punches from the get-go because it turns out that Red is missing. The champion and the strongest trainer in the Kanto region, missing for an entire month. He was last seen receiving a challenge from Bruno of the Elite Four in a specific location, with his damaged Pikachu walking into Professor Oak's lab confirming he's been defeated and nowhere to be found, immediately cementing the threat of the Elite Four who, if it isn't obvious enough with all the foreshadowing, are the antagonists of this story. What is their endgame, you may ask? Stay tuned to find out. And also like, comment, subscriber, please. That's when the protagonist, Yellow, finally shows up at the scene, revealing that he has the power to heal Pokemon of all their injuries with his touch alone by curing Pikachu. He then claims that it is his mission to find and rescue Red, prompting an altercation between himself and Professor Oak, which Yellow was able to win not inflicting any form of damage on Oak's Pokemon. This was enough to win his trust, and just like that, the journey begins. The journey to find Red and to stop the Elite Four of their mysterious plans. Just from this alone, the stakes are immediately high from the get-go. The fact that the antagonists in this manga are not above trying to outright kill the main characters really sells the severity of Red's disappearance. That guaranteed safety blanket that one can expect in the anime and games does not exist here. Red's life is in genuine danger. For 
Furthermore, Mr. Kusaka also takes advantage of the fact that this is a direct sequel through how he uses the cast. Unlike the first arc which only focused on showing events from just Red's perspective, this is the first time that different points of view are incorporated into the story, as not every chapter or scene centers around Yellow himself, but also the other Pokedex holders in blue and green, providing a complete breath of fresh air to the manga's storytelling and character work, which I'll get more in depth into later on. The shift in perspective also helped in making the Kanto region feel more like an alive world with actual inhabitants, with the returning cast extending to even the side characters as well that aren't just written off and disposed of in one episode like a piece of paper. Say no to littering. Speaking of environmental waste, this is one of the main themes of the story. With reference to the abandoned power plant, it is shown that the increase of industrialization has led to many wild Pokemon having their homes get taken away from them, forcing them to wander aimlessly in search of food and a new home, making them more desperate as a result, tying in very well with animals of today's world, thereby adding more realism and as a result, depth to this region, showing that consequences for advancing technology extend to the Pokemon world as well. What does this scenario have to do with the story as a result? You'll find out soon. For now, let's take a look at the characters and how well they are used. Starting with the protagonist, Yellow. If the beginning doesn't make it obvious enough, he has his fair share of mysteries. Just being able to heal Pokemon with his touch alone is enough to raise eyebrows. But it doesn't just end there, no siree. He also has the capability to communicate with Pokemon, going as far as even being able to see their own memories too, helping him establish that strong understanding with them. With the caveat being that it makes Yellow get worn down more easily causing him to just fall asleep every now and then. As a character, he is a naive optimist that is seen usually drawing on a sketchbook and always having a fishing rod at hand to help him in various situations. He also deeply cares for Pokemon of all kinds and hates the idea of them getting hurt. So much so that he is a full-on pacifist, refusing to inflict any damage on even his opponent's Pokemon, even if his life is on the line preferring instead to use unique, non-offensive methods to battle, as shown in his encounter against Professor Oak. His dislike for Pokemon battles makes him a complete departure from any known Pokemon protagonist. His team is also uniquely structured as well, consisting of Red's Pikachu and other Pokemon that's gifted to him by other characters, with his own being much weaker than the other Pokedex holders, only serving to add more uniqueness to him and how his battles pan out while simultaneously cementing how much of a naive idealist he is, which gives him his fair share of trouble. And even as I say all of this, there's much more to him than that. Hell, it isn't until he confronts Lorelei of the Elite Four that he gives away his name. Amario del Bosque Verde. Yes, that's his actual name in the localized version, and finding that out as I reread this arc left me very confused. Why is his name Spanish? Did the localizers look at his straw hat, think it looked close enough to be Speedy Gonzalez's sombrero to give him that name? Did I butcher the pronunciation? So many questions and such few answers. <laughs> Jokes aside, it's Spanish for yellow of the Viridian Forest. Pretty nice wordplay, I must say. However, that Spanish name is sacked for future arcs and his name stays as just yellow. So that's what we're gonna use. There's also an interesting story behind his supernatural abilities too so do expect more secrets to unravel as you continue. In fact, just gonna leave this out there, but those that have read the manga will notice a certain bit of misinformation I'm intentionally spreading right now. So please do let me know when you figure it out. All in all, it's these aforementioned mysteries surrounding him, along with his battles, that made me really enjoy his role as a protagonist. Of course, while Yellow is the primary protagonist of this arc, not all events are shown from just his point of view. Instead, there are shifts in perspective that primarily focus on the other two original Pokédex holders, Blue and Green. And I cannot stress enough just how much of a blessing it was for them, and especially the story. As good of a first arc the Red, Green, and Blue chapters are, its comparatively short length and focusing on only Red's point of view left a lot to be desired. Particularly in terms of screen time, and as a result, the fleshing out of characters that are not named Red, which both Green and especially Blue suffered from in my opinion. While we did see how Red influenced Green as a trainer in their encounters, we never really saw him outside of these moments, from how he interacts with other characters, to how he approaches harsh situations that don't involve Red, to a closer look on him and his story. 
Blue's case is even worse, because as entertaining and compelling of a character she was, she also had the least screen time among the trio, barely giving any room for her to get further fleshed out. This new approach in storytelling helps fix all of that, allowing us to get a closer look at them and how they have grown throughout the years, while also finding out more about their background, particularly Blue, who has by far the most interesting backstory to how she got kidnapped by flying Pokemon and got taken away from her home at a much younger age, not only giving her actual PTSD to flying type Pokemon, as shown in her fight against Oak, but also stripping her of a normal life. Having to spend all these years under a mysterious kidnapper who she never found the identity of. Which is a big part of why she's fighting the Elite Four, in order to find answers. Whereas for Green, the reason why he never met Red at a much younger age like in the games was because he was sent away to train, under the hands of a mysterious teacher, shaping him into the calm and composed analytical Pokédex holder that we all know, instead of being a guy dominated by his own arrogance like his game and anime counterpart. These shifts in perspective also act as a perfect catalyst towards seeing them and their Pokémon that we've come to know in action again, further adding to the quality of the battles and as a result, continuing. We get to see how both react to Red's disappearance and their contribution to the events of the story, with Green being a mentor figure to Yellow and teaching him about the shortcomings of his approach, helping him grow as a trainer and carry out his mission as a result. Even Blue has a mysterious connection with him too, being the person that sent Yellow on his mission in the first place. These shifts also act as a very ideal catalyst towards giving the rest of the cast more screen time. And this format has a clear purpose too, in terms of story direction. See, this is not a story where the protagonist Yellow will single-handedly solve every problem and take down all the obstacles in his way before beating the big bad. This is a story that requires everybody to directly work together and formulate plans just to even have a chance in the first place. A chance that is very small. And no, that very small chance isn't related to finding Red. That very small chance is related to stopping Kanto's biggest threat, the Elite Four. Picture yourself as a kid, playing Red and Blue for the first time. You finally win all eight badges, bringing you the closest to your dream before reaching the Indigo Plateau and finding out that you need to beat four elite trainers. Elite trainers that you have never seen before. Dubbed as the strongest of the Kanto region, the aura of mystery that surrounds it, creating the fear of the unknown, establishing that special presence, that mystique as you cross these halls, knowing that you're about to have the fight of your life. You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, I don't, because I never finished Red and Blue! Sorry about that. Let's try that one again, shall we? <laughs> Jokes aside, all of this applies to the Elite Four, but on a much grander scale. Four distinct individuals with their own unique style using their Pokemon in a way that is irreplicable by any living being. Not just selling them as what they are, but bringing a completely new standard to the term elite. Fighting under one united cause to eliminate humanity. Why you may ask? The Pokemon. See, the showing of deforestation, industrial waste, and other forms of pollution caused by the hands of mankind aren't for nothing. The wild Pokemon are suffering being stripped of their natural habitat as shown before, fostering the Elite Four's genuine resentment and hatred for humanity, to the point where they believe that the only solution is to wipe them out, save for a few that they deem to be Elite Trainers, giving the world back to the Pokémon and hitting that reset button, painted in crimson, orchestrated by none other than the leader of the Elite Four, Lance. This creates a very compelling scenario in the sense that there is a proper reason for all these motivations to exist in the first place. Many prefer a villain that has a point, and in that aspect, this is a situation that falls under that category. For humankind is responsible for all these Pokemon suffering. The suffering that they have no way to vocalize, leaving them in this terrible scenario. Which Lance believes the most, showing that there's much more to this version of the Dragon Master if him being an eco-terrorist isn't enough for you. One could say his heart is partially in the right place, because he loves Pokemon. He doesn't want them to suffer, just like Yellow. But that same love, along with other factors, has made him too far gone, to the point where he's willing to take such extreme lengths, which also makes him the best possible foil for someone like Yellow and vice versa. 
It is worth mentioning though that the Elite Force don't exactly pair it all his ideals to the team, with some having their own personal reasons to join his cause. Regardless, it isn't their ideals that made them amazing villains in my eyes. What took them to that next level is how they were handled as overpowered villains. It's no secret to a longtime Pokemon fan that the original teams of the Elite Four are rather dated. Due to the unbalanced proportion of types in the original 151 Pokemon, some of them have party members that are two of the same ones or look very out of place. Huh? Which both Agatha and Lance especially suffered from because for being Ghost and Dragon type specialists, these were the only ones available. In the manga though, absolutely none of that hindered them from giving the best possible action. For starters, each of the Pokemon of the Elite Four are capable of skills that are one of a kind, from Agatha's Gengar being able to trap and hypnotize its victims in a coffin made out of its own smog, to Bruno's Hitmonlee being able to unnaturally extend both his arms and legs due to elasticity, giving him unnatural range with his kicks and holds, to Lorelai's Jinx being able to make icy voodoo dolls out of its enemies, allowing her to entrap any of her victims' body parts she chooses with ice that cannot melt. To finally Lance himself and his two Dragoners, where one can summon thunderclouds at will, whilst the other can manipulate wind to its desire, making them a terrifying duo when paired together. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, with even more surprises awaiting them. It is with this level of innovative thinking that Mr. Kusaka was able to not just work with these supposed limitations, but make all their teams complement each other very well. He also made it a point to showcase their strategical prowess instead of making them just strong villains. From how they assess Red as the biggest threat to their cause on the day he became champion, formulating the perfect strategy to both corner and remove him from the equation, enabling them to go through with their plans, which has even more details than I'm letting out right now, making it on paper a 100% success rate. Therefore, not just making the heroes the underdogs, but having them forced to team up together. Even with rogue gym leaders like Lieutenant Surge, Sabrina, and Koga respectively, just to even have a chance against them in the first place. This is in my opinion where this arc thrives the most, because from start to finish, the Elite Four stayed as powerful threats. Riding overpowered villains is a tricky thing that can go wrong very easily and tarnish the mystique that you see in them at the very beginning. For it's one thing to establish that mystique and another thing to maintain it, which is exactly what Mr. Kusaka was able to do, while consequently using that said mystique to elevate the heroes to completely new heights, which is once again accomplished by well-constructed strategies that not even the most seasoned of shonen anime or manga viewers would expect, all of which are reinforced by proper logic, thereby making us admire the set characters for being able to come up with something so ingenious, while also cementing the fact that they're only being able to do any of this because they have the handicap advantage, which combined with how much they're struggling, despite said advantage, establishes the power of the Elite Four, proving how different the outcome would be if it was one-on-one, -on -one. therefore keeping their mystique well protected as a result. All of this genuinely makes me believe that as overpowered villains, they were not only written great, but written better than most other shows for more mature audiences. Of course, with good comes bad, and the yellow arc is by no means a perfect arc, for it had certain aspects that prevented it from being the best, at least in my eyes. For one, I'd say that through all its brilliance, it does have a couple of slow moments that almost killed the pacing for me. Furthermore, while I can confidently say that this is easily Mato's best work in the series in terms of both adorable and breathtaking panels, I did have some trouble following the battles at times, making me have to do double takes every now and then to see if I missed anything. Finally, the biggest sin of this whole arc would have to be none other than Agatha herself. As a villain, she and her Pokemon were able to perform their role just fine and also give us amazing battles to remember. But as a character? Nah. As per the games, her history with Professor Oak is brought up with her mirroring the sentiment of her in-game counterpart. Despite an attempt being made to flesh it out, it's honestly full of holds that only serves to make less sense about her motivations and overall character, coming off as something that's all over the place that is clumsily put together, only making you all the more confused as a result. Absolutely none of that explained to me why she fosters an extreme grudge against Oak. A grudge so extreme that she wants to outright murder his grandson Green as revenge. She never came off to me as a psychopath either, 
making all our motivations and our entire character just confusing as a whole, making her, unfortunately, the worst character in the Pokemon Adventure series. Shala booty. Minus these few messes, I can safely say that rereading this arc after over 6 years has still been a very pleasant experience. It's crazy to think that despite how old it is, running from 1998 to 2000, none of it has aged at all. Instead, it offers the complete breath of fresh air to any longtime Pokemon fan reading this for the first time. From the new story format to how the battles play out, with interesting themes that strongly resonate with the state of today's world, this arc takes the good yet incomplete start with both the main cast and the Kanto region of the first arc, fleshing them out and giving them much needed depth which is exactly what a sequel is supposed to do. Using an original character as a protagonist in yellow that more than fits with this premise, going from an innocuous pacifist kid on a mission to someone that comes to terms with battling in order to protect what he loves and also have a Spanish name for god knows why, <laughs> with a compelling mystery surrounding him to keep the reader's interest. And of course, overpowered villains in Elite 4 that more than pull their weight, giving you the best possible action. All under a supposedly morally great cause that ultimately is wrong because of their radicalism. It honestly astounds me to see how much thought got put into this arc. With the cherry on top being that during all of it, the stones are set for the future events of what's to come. Rereading this whole arc after all these years has honestly been a wonderful experience and a great reminder of why I fell head over heels for this manga. For it is a true step up from its predecessor and the beginning of what would be known as something truly legendary. And with that concludes my review of Pokemon Adventures Yellow. In all seriousness though guys, I'd like to sincerely apologize for making you all wait so long for this. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, a lot has happened in these last couple of months, but Understand that I don't have any intention of stopping anytime soon as I've shown in this video in reality I'm ready to kick things up to a much bigger gear and I got much bigger plans in store Especially when we're very close towards reaching 3,000 subscribers and beyond so yeah with that being said Please do leave a like on this video and subscribe already if you haven't as well as comment on what you think of the yellow arc in general So yeah with that said my name is Deuce Gunner. Thank you very much for watching have yourselves a glorious day, and I'll see you all on the flip side. Wish.